Hi, this is Brian Gracely, and in this video, we're going to look at uh, cloud computing, and really, we're going to kind of do a, a compare and contrast between. Um, I don't want to purely call it legacy technologies in cloud computing, but we want to look at sort of the evolution of uh, how applications have changed, how we design those applications, and how we operate those applications, and how this has changed based on a couple of trends that have happened with cloud computing. So. There's really kind of two trends that, that people can kind of wrap their head around um, when we talk about this, and it's good to make a compare and contrast because it really affects the type of technology we buy, uh, how applications are written, and some operational management models. So this is really a comparison, not between, I don't want to call it old and new, but it is somewhat of a kind of a, a legacy evolution track and a purely new track. And it's, and it's worth looking at those things very, very differently. Um, and see where the differences are as you're hearing terminologies about you know, web scale and, and, and you know, cloud ready applications versus sort of uh, applications that have been virtualized and, and other things like that. So um, let's start out by looking at you know, how did we kind of get to where we were, right? Um, and I've covered this in some other videos, but not necessarily in this series. So in the past, we, we started and we had applications and the applications had the expectation um, and sometimes people will call these legacy applications, uh, business applications, whatever, but, but you know, sort of traditional applications, more client server applications in many cases, uh, but business applications, where the applications were written and the applications are going to support various types of, of application level redundancy, right? So clustering type of technologies at the application level. But they also had um, a set of, of expectations that the infrastructure underneath that, the servers, the storage, the network, the security, was going to be highly, highly available, right? So they had, they wrote it such that um, the infrastructure underneath it was going to be highly available. And by that, it meant that the infrastructure had to um, build in a lot of capabilities to become highly available, never go down, have very predictable SLAs. So for example, uh, at the network level, um, you were going to have redundant pairs of network paths. You were going to have high availability technologies so that IP addresses would move, uh, routing would reconverge, uh, switching would happen extremely fast. At the storage layer, you had various types of RAID technologies to make sure that individual disk, if it failed, didn't take down an entire array or a, a set of data. Um, and the servers, you had you know, multiple types of redundant backplanes, redundant power supplies. In essence, what we had was a lot of high availability technologies built into the infrastructure because our applications were designed such that they expected that infrastructure to always be there for them. They really weren't designed necessarily uh, where, you know, things would completely go away at any point in time, okay? And this was fine. Um, so you had high availability built into you know, into the infrastructure, and you had some level at the applications as well, but they realized that, you know, there was quite a bit of availability that could be designed into the infrastructure, um, and while it added some cost, it didn't, you know, exponentially uh, build out that. And this was always the case for many enterprises and for government agencies, because they understood how to design architectures that had high availability at the infrastructure layer, they could buy those assets, uh, there was plenty of people that had those skill sets to help them take those types of uh, um, business applications and build them on high availability infrastructure. Now, that continues to this day. We still see that to a certain extent as applications become virtualized, as people begin to build out things like private clouds where they're trying to automate these capabilities. And in some cases, it still makes sense to have all that infrastructure availability in hardware. In some cases, it's sort of moving up stack a little bit into various software layers, and, and in many cases, sometimes this is the virtualization software that is providing that, but we're still very sort of infrastructure centric in terms of where high availability is built in. Now, in contrast to that, what we see is we see sort of a new model. I'm going to switch sides here. We see a new model, and this came out of um, uh, new companies, startups, new web developers who basically said, I don't have the resources to build um, cloud computing infrastructure. I don't have the resources to build server storage network infrastructure. I'm going to leverage you know, public clouds. I'm going to leverage Amazon's cloud or GoGrid's cloud or Rackspace cloud or anybody else's cloud. And in doing that, uh, they were able to get access to resources much cheaper. Uh, they didn't have to make big capital expenditures. 
But um, because those clouds in many cases, and I'm not uh, signaling out those individual providers because they've got different SLAs, but, but those public cloud services in essence were built somewhat in many cases as best effort, where the SLAs were uh, less stringent than they were in more of an enterprise, highly available infrastructure. So what you had is you still had infrastructure, right? You still had servers and storage and switches and all the network things and so forth, but it was less highly available, highly available. And we didn't necessarily know, those development organizations, those startups, didn't necessarily know exactly how that infrastructure was built. It was sort of abstracted to them. And so what they did is they built their applications, they built their applications with the expectation of a couple of things. One, the expectation was you were going to have uh, less highly available hardware, and so that the odds of it failing, the uh, predictability of it failing was going to go up, right? So you had less reliable, um, you know, the reliability was, was lower. Actually, I should probably draw this as, as lower. And so they had to build more capabilities into their application. They had to build their application such that it could withstand failure of an individual node. It could withstand not being able to reach from one, you know, from one piece of an application to another for longer periods of time than what it did. And so um, it began to build uh, the application framework such that um, it expected things to fail. It was sort of, you'll hear, built to fail and, and, and other sort of terminologies. And so what we're starting to see is we start to see the, the industry kind of clash a little bit sometimes about what's really the best way to build this. And what we, what we, in essence, what we see is um, the more of a legacy application that we have, right, uh, the more we expect high availability in my infrastructure. As things become sort of newer, uh, and by newer, uh, we'll sort of call that virtualization, right? Uh, maybe we don't need as much uh, hardware-based high availability infrastructure. We start to see more sort of high availability infrastructure but more of it becomes a mix between hardware and software. And, and this is, again, this tends to be sort of internal within my IT organization because I have those skills, I understand those architectures. But as I move more towards you know, public domains, public clouds where I don't necessarily have visibility to how they're doing things, I don't necessarily understand their architecture completely, it's not exposed to me. This is, in many cases, more of a private environment. Then what we see is the applications need greater availability. So our high availability moves up into the application with the expectation that the infrastructure is unknown or unreliable. And sometimes you'll hear this called commodity infrastructure, commodity hardware. And in some cases that relates to the cost of it. In some cases it relates to the how much uh, high availability is built in. It may have single points of failure. But in essence, the application now says, I don't know what this is going to be. This is a great unknown. And for some applications, this is fine. It's a new way of developing applications. It's a different way of developing applications or deploying applications. And it's not right or wrong. It's just uh, the model that's evolved out of more public cloud infrastructures because the application developers, the startups, and, and other groups that were developing in this space just didn't know it was here. It was an unknown, and there wasn't a way to get detailed information about it. And over time, they didn't have a way to control this like they did in a, in a more private environment. So as we hear about you know, things like, you know, what does the infrastructure look like for private cloud? What does the infrastructure look like for public cloud? You hear terminology like commodity infrastructure, commodity computing, commodity networking. Some of that is, comes out of this space. It comes out of the public space because those service providers were trying to keep certain aspects of cost down. Some of it comes out of, um, you know, new development models where they say, I can assume that I don't know anything about the infrastructure. Maybe that's in our best interest to not know anything about that, assume it's going to fail, and build the redundancy into the application. In other cases, as people sort of move along this continuum from sort of legacy applications to more virtualized, newer applications, um, you know, they're going to have a mix of, of, you know, where the high availability is from, you know, very much hardware-based, infrastructure-based, to a mix of hardware and software, somewhat in virtualization, somewhat in the applications, to you know, much more application-based. And this evolution um, is, is not going to be sort of cut and dry. It's going to evolve over time. And the key is to understand, where are my applications deployed? Are they deployed in environments where I don't have visibility to the infrastructure? Hence, my applications have to be smarter. 
Are they deployed in environments where I do have visibility to the infrastructure and I can sort of plan my applications around that? Am I building a new application? Am I taking a legacy application and, and porting it somewhere? Having visibility into those things, having knowledge of when you need to have visibility and not have visibility is going to be really, really critical as more and more IT organizations, CIOs, and businesses think about if I start in one cloud with an application and I want to migrate that application or I want to start with new applications and move them from one cloud to another, it's very, very important to realize where do I have high availability? Is it in the infrastructure? Is it in the application? Is it a mix of both of those? And it's very, very important to understand when do I have visibility to those that infrastructure? When don't I have visibility? When does it make sense to add the complexity in the application for high availability? Or when does it make sense to allow the infrastructure to do that? So hopefully this was helpful to give you an overview of sort of the evolution of how uh, availability of, of cloud infrastructure, of cloud application sort of architecture without going into the application has evolved, why it's evolved, and the types of decisions and knowledge that people have that are deploying clouds need to be aware of to best make sure that their application stays highly available, whether that availability is coming from the software layer, at the application layer, or some of it's coming from the infrastructure layer. Thanks again for watching the videos and have a great day.